leadership crisis in the world today, and it all stems from a lack of character. And that lack of character leads to lack of trust, and lack of trust leads to lack of influence, and no ability, no ability to influence others in a positive direction because they no longer trust anybody. Have you run into anybody like that? Oh no, I don't trust anybody. Don't trust anybody. Now I 100% agree there are a lot of untrustworthy people out there. But one thing I've learned is I don't judge people by the color of their skin. I don't judge people by their age. I don't judge people by what county, what school. I don't judge people by labels at all. Because I know a person stands or falls on their character. And you can go to any church and you can find people with character and people without. You can go to any school, any country, because the wheat and tares are all together on earth. John Wooden, the great coach of the UCLA Bruins, won 10 championships his last 12 years. And his dad, a farmer in Indiana, didn't have any money, barely made enough, raised enough produce and food to feed his family. But he gave John Wooden something amazing. He taught him principles to live his life by. And one of the cards, he gave him a couple cards, and he had a few things written on them. And the first ones, there were three principles. Never lie, never cheat, and never steal. Can you imagine how good your life would be if, first of all, you decided in your own personal life, I'm going to live a life where I stop lying. I stop cheating and I stop stealing. Now I know when I say that, most of you are like, no, we're not. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't steal. And so then the fourth one probably should be don't self-deceive. <laughs> um, definitely making friends now. Okay. Well, let's go through it. <clears throat> Author Jack Canfield once wrote, in reality, lying is the product of low self-esteem. The belief that you and your abilities are not good enough to get what you want. The false belief that you cannot handle the consequences of people knowing the truth about you, which is simply another way of saying, I am not good enough. Have you ever spent time with someone that you, you figured out, oh, they, they just lie a lot? Or maybe exaggerate a lot. Remember that one guy? He's like, yeah, we had two, three, five. We had ten million dollars. Yeah, that's the ticket. <laughs> you know, it's like whatever. It's like, no, one's not up. Two, ten, ten. Why ten? Yeah. It's like, or someone, you know, it's like, how many people were at the meeting? Why, we had ten, fifteen, twenty, fifty. People, yeah, we have 50 people there. And, and why do they do that? I mean, if they had 10, they had 10. But why do they have to say 50? Because they want so badly for someone to be impressed with them. And they don't think that 10, the truth, will be impressive enough. So they have to lie or exaggerate because they want so badly for someone to accept them. And, and the principle is, your integrity should never be for sale. Never sell your integrity for acceptance. Because what you will end up with is not only not acceptance, but you won't even accept yourself. Because you know yourself as a liar. Don't ever sell out your integrity. Never lie. Number two, that Wooden's dad taught him. Never cheat. So many people think that cheating is the quick way to success. Cheating is the fastest way to have no leadership. How 
far would you follow someone that you know has cheated you? That's why it cracks me up, because I see, when pe if people have thousands of people following them year after year after year, one thing you can pretty much bank on is they're not cheating too many people. Because, as Abraham Lincoln said, <clears throat> you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Socrates said, if it were necessary to do or to suffer injustice, I would choose to suffer injustice. Why? Because he knows if he suffered injustice, oh, it might hurt you financially. Someone may steal some money from you. Someone may cheat you out of something that you deserved. But that doesn't ruin your character. If you cheated somebody else out of something, out of their money, now you're damaging your character. Something way more... Money can be replaced much faster than character can be rebuilt. And reputations restored. I mean, you're, it's like choosing the little things and giving up the big things. Keep the big things. Keep your character. Don't sell out. Don't sell out. Never cheat. Never cheat. Man, I, I love competition. And I play racquetball. And if you've ever played racquetball, really intense racquetball, there's times when you're charging to the front and that ball's bouncing and you're reaching. And there's only two points that separate you from the victory. And you reach for it and you're not sure if the ball hit the racket first or the ground, but you really wanted it to hit your racket first. <laughs> you know what my rule is? If I'm not sure, it's their point. Because I never, ever, ever want to win and him thinking, oh, he cheated me, that, that wasn't in. And so I'm like, I think, I don't think that was in, unless the other guy says, nope, I saw your racket, it was for sure you got it, then it's his point. Oh, but Orrin, but then... If he doesn't play the same way, then he's got an unfair advantage. I'd much rather him win and then, and then me win and inside thinking, I'm not sure if I really won. I'd rather lose and then have to work better. My wrestling coach taught me a long time ago. He said, when you're out there wrestling, you're not just wrestling the opponent. You're also wrestling against the ref. If the ref makes a mistake on a call, you've got to be good enough to beat him anyway. In the same way. Don't cheat, don't steal. It's not the way we play the game. Author Chuck Colson, <clears throat> one of my favorite stories because Chuck Colson was the hatchet man. That's what they called him. The hatchet man for Richard Nixon. During Watergate, he was right there in the front lines. He actually went to prison for a period of time. You'd say, why would you be quoting Chuck Colson? And I'm talk about character. Because Colson spent years of his life ruining his character. And then met the person with perfect character. And the turnaround in his life is amazing. And he realized that he was living situational ethics. He said, I was the poster child for situational ethics. I would argue, well, given the situation that we should be able to do this because this benefits society overall, even though it might be cheating, but overall it's good, situational ethics. With situational ethics, you could argue anything's good. There's absolutes. When is ever cheating a good thing? Was ever lying a good thing? And so he wrote an article and he said, why Harvard can't teach ethics? Because Harvard went and said, well, we don't believe in absolutes. You see, ideas have consequences. And as soon as you say there's no more absolutes, that, well, no lying, you can't really say lies are wrong. You can't say cheating's wrong. It just depends on the situation. And so he wrote an article, he said, why Harvard can't teach ethics? And he started that conversation with some of the leaders over at Harvard, and they agreed to have him come in. He said, man, he said, when I decided to come in and give a talk to their top MBA students, 
I figured, man, there's going to be a riot after they hear what I have to say. Because this is going to be totally against what they've been learning over the last few years. Here's what he said. I expected a riot after my 45-minute talk to a packed lecture hall. But the students were docile. I didn't hear a single good question. Were the students so unfamiliar with moral philosophy they didn't even know enough to challenge me? I left Harvard worried. What would happen to these students when they became leaders of American business? One of the students at Harvard during that time was Jeffrey Skilling, the now discredited former Enron CEO. <laughs> Ideas have consequences. Are you going to live your life where you can justify anything you do? Because under the situation, I don't think so. Because even if you believe that, I can promise you the people around you won't. They just won't trust you. And again, if they don't trust you, you have no influence. See, we need to go even beyond just integrity. Not just the don'ts, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. We got to go to something even more. See, integrity is what you don't do. Character, integrity is not doing wrong. Character is doing right. What do you mean, Warren? Well, integrity would be if you see somebody bullying somebody else, you're like, well, I'm not bullying that person, so I have integrity. But do you have enough character to go over there and stop the bullying? And all of us, oh, yeah, we would do that. Really? Because there's a lot of times that bullying can be not necessarily somebody physically bullying. There can be companies that are doing wrong behaviors. Oh, but I don't want to get involved because if I say something that might jeopardize this. And I'm pretty comfortable and, you know, under the circumstances, I feel for me, what's the principle? What's the principle? And if you're a principle-centered person, then you follow the principle. And you let God deal with the consequences. Because that's what men of character do. That's what women of character do. In, a, in the book, Resolved, I go through the 13 resolutions that can radically transform somebody's life if you're applying them consistently. And I will tell you this. Character is the foundation of them all. If you miss out on this one, I'm almost hoping that you don't get the other ones. Because if you gather the other ones, but you don't have character, then the other principles are used for manipulation or for personal benefit versus for service for others. The idea of character is it foundationally keeps one on solid ground. The formula for character, character equals integrity multiplied by courage. That is the missing thing today. Courage. Do you have courage to stand up for the right things when they need to be stood up for? And how many times do you see that people aren't standing up when they should be standing up? C.S. Lewis said, Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at its testing point. See, courage is the thing that says, well, are you really principle-centered? Because, man, everybody can talk about being principle-centered on a calm sea. When there's no storm, everybody's principle-centered. Yeah, we can all say it. But when the storms of life happen, can you apply the proper principle at the right time, even when it hurts? Because this is where you see people flip-flop. You see them go from, well, that's what I do believe, but under the circumstances, I think we ought to do this. Or I don't feel this way. How about, have you ever noticed 
Most marriages, I think, when, when you go to a wedding, you hear something like this. For better or for worse, till death do us part. Anybody ever heard that one? And anybody ever been at a wedding where you heard that and then they got divorced? Did they misunderstand the words? Did they think it was for better or for worse, unless it gets worse? <laughs> now, I, listen, I'm not here. I understand. If somebody walks out on you and doesn't come back, you're divorced. I get that. But if two people were truly living those principles, would you agree there'd probably be a lot less divorces? Because what would happen is they'd be like, well, since we both have character and since we made a covenant, a commitment, we better figure out how to make it better since we can't end it. Let's figure out how to make it better. As long as you have that back door open, sneaking out the back door is a lot. Well, I was principle-centered until I didn't feel like being principle-centered anymore. See, that's feeling-centered. That's not principle-centered. When you went up there and said, for better or for worse, till death you oh yeah, I was feeling it then. But after a year, two years, five years, I wasn't feeling it anymore. That's why the principle's there. See, the principle should be followed even when you don't feel like it. That's why it's called principle-centered and not feeling-centered. Do you know what I'm saying? So many people say, oh, I'm principle-centered, but they respond feeling-centered. Do you think there are times in my relationship with Lori where I didn't feel like being married? Do you think there are times with some of my friends where they let me down or I let them down where we could have just said, well, that's it. We just will never talk to each other again. But that's when you need the principle. When you feel like applying the principle the least, that's when you need to apply the principle the most. Those are the times... Chris Brady and myself have been business partners for 22, 23 years now? A long time. Do you think in that time that there were times where we misunderstood each other? But you know, on all that time, all that time, I've never gotten a call from Chris where he's yelling and screaming at me, I'll never talk to you again, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> Can you even imagine that? It'd almost be laughable. If he did it, I'd be like, ha ha, that's a good one, April Fools. Because <laughs> I know Chris. I know exactly. Chris is one of the most predictable people in the world. You know why? Because I know how he'll respond. Because I know he's principle-centered. And we both know the same principles. Because we both follow the same book. <laughs> George Gazzardo. Whatever I said, however long I've had a relationship with Chris in business, it's been another year for George. Same exact thing. I know how George is going to respond. Principle-centered people are very predictable because, listen to this, they actually follow the principles. Even when they don't feel like it. That's what a character-centered person does. Martin, Reverend Martin Niemöller spent most of World War II in a Nazi prison camp. Here's what he said. First they arrested the communists, but I was not a communist, so I did nothing. Then they came to the social democrats, but I was not a social democrat, so I did nothing. Then they arrested the trade unionists, and I did nothing because I was not one. And then they came for the Jews and the Catholics, but I was neither a Jew nor a Catholic, and I did nothing. At last they came for me and arrested me, and there was no one left to do anything about it. Martin Niemöller recognized his lack of character came back onto him. When should he have done something? When should he have applied the principle and said, Hey, this isn't right. One of the things that 
The reason evil can flourish so much today is because the people with light think they're playing defense. The people with light are not playing defense against darkness. Darkness cannot assault light. Light assaults darkness. One light turning on can wipe out a lot of darkness. It just takes enough courage to lift your lamp up. Do you have that courage tonight? <laughs> Gus Lee said it this way. Courage doesn't depend on practical outcomes, risk versus gains analysis, or collateral impact on others. That's pragmatism. Pragmatism is the application of practicality, utility, and consequences to decision-making. In other words, what's in it for me? What's my be Oh, they're doing something wrong, but I might be able to benefit if I side with them. That's not what you do. What's the right thing to do? Yeah, but if I do that, that could be risky. I might lose some money. might lose some friends. I might be criticized. If it's the right thing to do, it's time for you to do it. Because otherwise, a piece of your character is ripped away from you. And now you're losing eternal things for external things. Stephen Carter, professor of Yale Law, talked about the difference because he said, what? Don't sometimes you have to compromise? Here's what he said. Compromises that advance high principles are acceptable. Those that do not advance high principles are not. So you got to ask yourself, and it takes wisdom, that as you're going through life, there are times when compromise is cowardice. And there are times where compromise, like, okay, I can compromise on this because we're moving towards the mark. And it's going to take wisdom. And that's why having a multitude of counselors is a very good thing. Think for yourself and then check your thinking with some of the people that you respect the most. Robert Morissette, author Robert Morissette said, I've heard it said that courage is not the absence of fear, but the perception that there is something far more important at stake. Having such a something gives us the ability to resist giving in to the fear and eventually rise above it. It is only in the presence of fear that true courage can be exercised. But without this something, how can we see beyond those things we're afraid of? In other words, have something so big, knowing that you stand for something so big that selling out is just not acceptable. Even if, oh, but I'm afraid. You're going to be afraid. That's what courage is. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is, I feel fear, but I still know in my heart this is right. And I fear selling my character more than I fear any consequences that could happen in this situation. Oh, where are the men like that? Oh, with ten men like that, we could turn everything. I believe we're going to raise them. I believe we have men like that. There's a, Lord Acton said, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. I would say it like this. Absolute power doesn't corrupt, it reveals. The corruption was there the whole time. The opportunity to, to apply the corruption wasn't. When a person becomes a dictator and, oh, I've got all this control, man, now you're going to see the reason why one person shouldn't have total power is because when one person has total power, they start compromising and you start seeing the corruption within. All of us have that corruption. 
In fact, I would say someone that wants absolute power is already proving their corruption. That's why I love having a working in all of the companies I work with is having policy councils, having other trusted counselors that I can make sure my thinking, because I understand left to myself that I might miss something, that I might be thinking wrong, that uh, I, it's the mind can convince yourself, that, oh, you're following the principle, but maybe you're not. So the way to protect yourself is check it with other people that you know are principle centered. Protect yourself. Frederick Bastiat in the 19th century revealed, Now since man is naturally inclined to avoid pain, and since labor is pain in itself, it follows that men will resort to plunder whenever plunder is easier than work. In other words, if you could get a free ride off of somebody else's efforts, would you take it? Everybody says, no, I'd never take it. Well, then where are all the people taking it? Because there sure are a lot of them. But everybody you talk to, not one of them would ever do it. But there's a lot of them doing it. It's amazing. They never come to any of my meetings. <laughs> what happens is it's so easy to recognize. What Bastiat's saying is most people, when he's talking, he's talking about mankind in general, He's saying, if you leave the door open for plunder, people will plunder. So you got to close that door. Individually, we all have a choice. What if you had a job that you could sneak out at lunch every day and just go home and sleep, and you, they would never know, and they'd pay you a full day anyway? Is that still considered plunder, Orrin? Because I want to change my answer that I gave you earlier. <laughs> Well, did you earn the hours? Did you truly earn that money, or did you take from somebody else's production? I'm telling you, it's easy for all of us to be principle-centered. And listen, when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to me. Every single one of these. When you write a book and you write a chapter on character, it's very soul-searching. Say, well, now hold on a second, Woodward. But that's one of the most healthy things in the world. It's healthy when you recognize the gap so that you can begin to work on it. Ignorance of the gap is dangerous. Close the gap. Close the gap every day. Identify where the gap is and start closing it every day. That's what a person of character does. Because if you're not doing that, you're in self-deception. You're self-deceived. If you're not closing the gap, then somehow you convince yourself you have no gap. And if you have no gap, that means you're perfect. And I would like to shake your hand because you're the first person that I've met in the flesh that's perfect. All the rest of us have a gap. All the rest of us, maybe I should say it this way, Recognize there is a gap. But if you don't recognize your gap, what happens is, what happens is, you've begun to lie to yourself. Remember where we started, John Wooden? Never lie. And all of us probably thought about that and said, I, I don't lie. Can I give you a different definition of lying? Because all lying begins with lies to self. Here's the one that got me. This one was... Stephen Covey dropped me and kicked me below the belt. It was, I was an engineer. I was on a 45-minute lunch. I, was, I had my Lumina parked underneath this big maple tree, and I'm reading this book. And Stephen Covey said that if you've ever set the alarm clock that you were going to get up early to do some reading, or you set the alarm clock that you were going to get up early to work out, or you set the alarm clock because you were going to get up early for morning prayers with your wife, or whatever it was, and that alarm clock went off, and you shut it off, and you kept sleeping. Liar! If you ever said to yourself that you were going to do something in business, or with your family, or with one of your kids... 
and you didn't follow through, you were lying. And it hit me the most as I said, well, no wonder I'm not following through with commitments to others. I'm not even following through with commitments to myself. I am a liar. There is a gap. I'm not perfect. These were big revelations at that moment. Because up to that point, I was so self-deceived, I thought I was the only one that had it all figured out. In my own mind, I was legendary. <laughs> but only my own. <laughs> Everybody else said he's something, but it ain't legendary. I can promise you that. <laughs> Covey wrapped it up, he said, many times, success is mind over mattress. I'm like, whoa, that is deep. You, I'm telling you, when I wake up now, you should see how fast I jump out of bed. Woo! Because I know that if I start making and following through on commitments, now listen, just act like nobody else is here, it's just you and me. Have you made commitments to yourself that you've not followed through on? And if that's the case, don't use that as, see, I'm going to go beat myself up and feel miserable for the next year. I'm just going to tell you this. Welcome to the club. The club includes everybody here and everybody who's not here. It's a really big club. It's called Humanity. So don't feel bad about it. What you do next, though, is absolutely essential. If you leave here and say, I'm just going to forget that Orrin talked about that, then you've begun the process of lying again. You've begun the process of self-deception again. And any man or woman that will lie to themselves will surely lie to others. All integrity begins with integrity to self. And then from that base, spans out to integrity to others. So determine the things that you've committed to do to yourself and start doing them. Start honoring your own commitments so you, so you can become honorable to others. It will radically transform your life because you're starting to move towards the light, away from darkness and lies, and towards truth, honor, and integrity, character. That's where you're after. So many people blame others. Well, the reason that's happened is because so-and-so and that, and we can find and everybody can find somebody to blame for your life. But Shakespeare, hundreds of years ago, said the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Shakespeare understood human nature so well. He understood it. It's us. We're the ones who didn't follow through on those commitments. Hey, listen, do things do bad? Things happen to good people? Absolutely. Are you going to be dealt some bad cards in life? Absolutely. But you can play another hand. You can live another day. You start following these principles and rid yourself of self-deception. How do you do that, Oren? Start telling yourself the truth. There's this really cool book that says something like, the truth will set you free. And I'm going to add one more verse to it. But only after it ticks you off really bad. <laughs> the truth is, it, it, it absolutely, the truth will set you free. But only after you realize the magnitude of how bad you've messed it up. It's only when you're like, man, I really, I really did mess it up. 
It really isn't so. It isn't my parents. My parents aren't responsible for my life. Because no matter what they did, but they were mean to me, they abused me, they did all this. All of that's in the past. And it's the choices you made after that that's created the life you have now. I'm not, I'm not justifying any of their behaviors. I've had bad things happen to me. But I'm going to allow that one incident or that one experience to define who I am the rest of my life? How foolish. The truth will set you free. That person had a problem. That person had a sin. Their sin will not define my future anymore. <laughs> Stephen Covey's son, M.R. Covey, said trust, because all leadership, again, boils down to trust. And listen, to, oh, I love this one. He said trust is a function of two things, character and competence. Character we talked about. That's integrity and courage equals character, right? Multiply that by competence. For example, how many people here have I said, how many people here say, I trust Orrin? I trust Orrin. How many people say that? Okay, I appreciate that. That's, that's a lot of hands. I, I'm honestly honored by that. Now, let me ask this. If you're having heart surgery tomorrow, well, you said you trust me. I'm on the job. How many people are like, can I have a recount? Can I, can I vote again? Now, wait a minute. I thought you said you trusted me. You, I, listen, I really want you to get better. You got a heart. I got some hands. Let's go. <laughs> and you're like, see, it seems like all of a sudden you're hesitant. I don't see as many hands up anymore. See, what, what I'm showing is, yeah, but Orrin, I trust you. I trust you have character, but I just don't think you have competence in this area. And without the competence, I can't have you touching my heart. Because well, although you may have character, you do not have competence in that area. You see, trust has to have both, doesn't it? And so, as you're living a life in, of integrity... As you're living a life of courage and you're building character. Now in whatever field that you're doing, you have to build competence. And when you have character and competence combined, now people trust you. Because they know you're going to do the right thing and you know how to do right. And when you have both of them, people will follow you. It doesn't matter if other people criticize whatever, you're like, nope. I know that person knows what to do and they're doing right and I will follow them because they are leading me to a better outcome than where I was leading myself before. I'm part of a community that's doing something bigger than themselves. That's what character is. When enough people with character and competence join together, they can create community. And communities can change the world one person at a time. Communities. Edmund Burke called it, Edmund Burke called them little platoons. Edmund Burke was the same one. The only reason that evil flourishes is because good men do nothing. He said we need little platoons. We need people leading right where they're at. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing. I mentioned Chuck Colson earlier. He strongly emphasized little platoons and he built a big platoon. He, he moved out of the uh, Richard Nixon. He served his time in jail and he was given his calling. He realized, man, there's a lot of people that are serving time that are not getting the proper information. They're not getting the things that they need so that they can change their life. And they're noticing that they would get out of jail and they'd end up right back in jail. Called recidivism, I think. And it's, it's repeating call that. That sounds easier. Uh, <laughs> and so he started a little movement that ended up becoming a worldwide global movement of helping people when they get out of jail, when they get out of prison, not return. From the smallest of things, from power broker with the president, 
to spending time in prison, to going out and building his platoon and leading with character and competence. Can it happen? Absolutely. Can it happen for you? You say, oh, I messed things up. Have you messed it up to the point where you got sent to prison? Maybe you have, and you can change. Lori and I <clears throat> went back and watched the J.R.R. Tolkien films, The Lord of the Rings. And in the two towers, there's a powerful example of the little guy, the one that nobody thought could do anything, standing in the gap. There was a conversation be between Frodo and Sam. And Frodo was talking to Sam just like, I can't do this, Sam. What was he feeling? He's feeling, I just, I'm just, a, I'm a hobbit. I'm just a little hobbit. What can a little hobbit do? It's all this evil and all this darkness. Sam says, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. But we are. It's like the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folks in those stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't. Because they were holding on to something. And Frodo asked... What were they holding on to, Sam? Sam said, that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Yeah. In the 1950s, right after World War II, a whole bunch of Germans, Moravian Germans, moved to Belize. And the Belizean government was like, well, we know they're not Nazis and they're kind of peculiar people. What are we going to do with these? Well, yeah, we'll, I guess we'll take them, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to give them the worst land in Belize. We'll give them the land that nobody else wants. They called it the wasteland. Nobody else is living there anyway. We'll just give them that. Well, I mean, what's the worst thing that happened is wasteland anyway. That was in the 1950s, early 1950s. If you go to Belize today, and you ask, take me to the best part of Belize, they will take you to that former wasteland. These Moravian Christians shined light into darkness and converted a wasteland into the most productive land that if you go ask the people of Belize, they say you can tell immediately when you enter into the Moravian area. It's beautiful. Everything's manicured. Everything's, it's just, it's a paradise. They made a productive land out of a once former wasteland. It's exactly what can happen in your life. If you tell me, if you come to me and say, I've wasted my life. I've done so many things wrong. I didn't live with character. I messed up this. I messed up this. And I would tell you to do the same thing that Moravians did. To start applying the principles we talked about tonight. And what you will do is you can... You can, by the grace of God, turn a wasted life into a productive life. One that shines light into others. It's time to have the courage to change. It's time to have the courage to do. It's time to have the courage to be. Don't worry about feeling small. Everybody's small. But it's only when you fear no fall. 
that you can be willing to do something great. It's our moment. It's our time. Let's do what we know we have to do. God bless you.